Hello, welcome to the latest episode of Data Unchained. I'm the host, Molly Presley. So what is this podcast all about? The paradigm for data access has changed. In today's decentralized world, getting data to remote workers, distributed applications, artificial intelligence engines is a challenge. Data and Chain digs into the challenges as well as the solutions to make data an asset as a globally accessible resource. For today's guest, before I jump into introductions, I think it'll be fun to kind of challenge even what we're talking about on Data Unchained is not just being about things on this earth, but things in space and kind of more terrestrial access to data. Um, Les Johnson, Darren Wallace, thank you both for joining. Um, maybe we can talk just a little bit about each of you and your background, starting with Les. So Les, you work for NASA as the principal investigator of the solar sail for near earth asteroid scout mission. Did I get that right? You got it right. It's a mouthful, Perfect. but you did it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about yourself and what this mission is about, please. Sure. I'll be glad to do that. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I work for NASA. We're at the, Darren and I are both at the Marshall Space Flight Center, which is in Huntsville, Alabama. And we are the lead center for the Near Earth Asteroid Scout mission. And this uh, project for me is really the culmination of about uh, 20 years of off and on work on a pretty innovative propulsion technology called solar sails. And my background as a physicist gets me um, excited about how to find novel new ways to move spacecraft around in deep space. Uh, quick background, I'm originally from East Kentucky. I've got to give a shout out to folks up there in Kentucky who might be listening. Um, went to college, uh, Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky, graduate school at Vanderbilt. And I've spent most of my career here at NASA. I've been here a little over 30 years. Had the privilege of working on many advanced propulsion and other uh, future space missions. But I'm probably most excited about the one we're talking about today because it's really the uh, first time to do a pretty exciting uh capability technology demonstration and, and actually enable it, using it to enable us to do some new science out in deep space. So I'm looking forward to telling everybody about it. Super cool. Um, Darren Wallace, you also work for NASA. You're a program manager for the satellite as the satellite operations director. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and your role in this mission? Darren Wallace. So originally from New York, uh, went into the Air Force in, in 2000, or actually 1993, retired in 2013. Worked satellites just about my whole Air Force career, from the GPS satellites to the, some defense satellites. Um, got into the NASA world around 2013, 2014 timeframe. Uh, worked ISS, the International Space Station, as an ops controller. Um, got picked up for working small satellite projects in 2017. Uh, starting here with, with Near Earth Asteroid Scout. Got picked up for another mission that, uh, that unfortunately we, we, we had to put on standby for right now, the Solar Cruiser mission. Um, and then brought back to the Near Earth Asteroid Scout mission to to help out with their mission operations, and, and that's what I do. My mission operations uh, operations director. Um, we take the execution of the mission, so everything that's designed and built and, and and ready for flight, we go ahead and we execute the the concept of operations and the op operations plan. I can only imagine the complexity of I think about all the project managers program managers of things for just software and data. I can only imagine the complexity of a project like this encompassing all the things we worry about on Earth, plus trying to get up into space, into deep space, transmit data back and forth. I, I can only imagine the complexity. Um, it's great that there's people focusing on this. And, you know, I personally love to see the interest and the investment in space. It seems like our interest as a country waned for a bit in this area and is so just um, personally inspiring to see this kind of work occurring. So super cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about the projects you're working on and specifically how data is used in them. I know when we were first having a conversation, I was talking about some of the work um, myself and the company I work for are doing with kind of the lower earth orbit data. Um, and then you were talking about how in deep space is a much more difficult challenge. Maybe one of you could delve a little bit into that just of communications and data um, challenges that you're looking to solve? Let me start out by giving an overview of what the mission is, and then I can hand it off to Darren to talk a little bit more about how we use the, the NASA networks to get it back home. Um, Near Earth Asteroid Scout is a small spacecraft mission. Our spacecraft, uh, all packaged up when it launches, is about the size of a toaster oven. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's pretty small. Um, it's, it's one of 10 small spacecraft that are flying on NASA's Artemis One mission which is the big new rocket, the Space Launch System, 
which will, uh, when it launches, will take a, a, a large capsule that will eventually carry people back to the moon on a test flight around the moon and back to the Earth. And after that Orion capsule is deployed and on its way to the moon for its, its uncrewed test, each of these 10 small spacecraft uh, will be deployed from the upper stage that remains in deep space. It'll be on its way to the moon, somewhere between the Earth and the moon. And ours is one of those 10 small spacecraft. After we're deployed from that big rocket, uh, we'll check out the spacecraft, uh, deploy the solar panels, make sure the battery can recharge. We'll test out the radio, call home. We won't be too far away. We'll be on our way to the moon. Uh, kind of far away for you and me. <laughs> but in terms of where this thing's going, ultimately, it's pretty darn close. Um, and then after we've hung around in the moon and checked out the spacecraft and have the right phasing for everything, uh, that's when we deploy the, the propulsion system that will take the spacecraft from around the moon uh, out the next several million miles uh, to get to the asteroid that we're going to do science at. Uh, we're about a two-year mission. Uh, the ultimate goal is to carry a camera built by NASA JPL, uh, and that part of the project is led by our colleague, Dr. Julie Castillo-Roger at NASA JPL. But the job of the solar sail and the spacecraft, which is what we're really responsible for flying, and, and my team was responsible for building the solar sail propulsion system, is to take the spacecraft from near the moon, get it through space, catch up with the asteroid, match velocity with it so we can fly by it pretty close with the camera and do science. And we're doing this with a new kind of propulsion called a solar sail, S-A-I-L. I have to be careful of my uh, acquired North Alabama accent when I say the word sail so people understand uh, exactly what I'm saying. And, and a solar sail is, is pretty neat. It's a way of moving, maneuvering through space without fuel. So um, your, your viewers, if you go outside on a, on a sunny day and the sun's overhead and the sunlight's falling on you and reflecting from you, you don't feel it, but that light is pushing on you. And it's the, the particles of light, the individual photons that have momentum. They don't have any rest mass, but they have momentum. And as they reflect from you, it's like a game of pool. <laughs> you know, one ball hits the other and it recoils while all these photons are falling on you. You don't feel that recoil because the force of gravity is, is much, much stronger. The wind currents are much stronger. But when you get out into space and you're away from the gravity and the air and you deploy a large lightweight reflector, something that looks like a, uh, a sheet of aluminum foil, a much, much lighter weight, the light reflecting from that sail will push on it and make it recoil and give it a constant low push. And that's how we pick up speed, change our course, and match velocity with the asteroid. So over time, this small push, which is about the equivalent that you would get if you had two soccer fields of sunlight uh, falling on you, about the same as a quarter on your hand, right, would feel. That's the total amount of push you would feel from that much light. But it's constant because the sun's always shining. So that's how we use the sunlight pressure to take this little spacecraft across several million miles of space to catch up with the asteroid. And this will be the first time anyone's uh, used a solar sail, which have been tested in space, uh, use it to actually go from point A to point B to do a science mission. So we're really excited about, about demonstrating this new capability. Dr. Julie Castillo-Roger is my, my colleague. She is the uh, principal investigator for the science of NEA Scout. And she was responsible for developing the camera and will be the principal person uh, looking at all the data that comes in once we reach the asteroid. I have so many questions and probably not all of them are even appropriate for this podcast, but let's talk with Darren a little bit more about the technology, the data side, and then I'll see what other questions we might have. So on the spacecraft, you know, he mentioned that it's it's about the size of a toaster oven. So that toaster oven is constantly producing data, all the different parts and components of it. And the flight software on board gathers that data and transmits it through the transponder back down to the earth, where we have a network of ground stations out at JPL or JPL managed ground stations the Deep Space Network that'll um, communicate with, with the satellite and provide information back here to the HOSC at, at Huntsville, down in Huntsville, Alabama. We'll take that data from Huntsville, reprocess it, and then send it out to JPL to some of the science team that's out there so they can you know, look at the data and, and see any trends and analysis that they need to do on their part. Um, we're made up of, of, of multiple teams. I, I know Dr. Johnson had hit on that before. You've got the, the mission operations team, the team I'm the lead for, or one of the leads for. Cliff Jones is the other uh, operations director. 
Um, you've got the guidance control team that Andy, Dr. Andy Heaton is, is, is the lead for. You've got the navigation team out at JPL. You've got the science and camera team out at JPL. So it's, it's really a, a, a community, if you will, of, of, of teams that to make this project work. And we're just a small part of it. Um, I know you said you had specific questions, but I'll, I'll kind of hit on some of the challenges that we, that we have. Um, so being in multiple centers, dealing with, you know, uh, here in Huntsville, Alabama and out at JPL and, and out in Pasadena, California, it's a little bit easier on earth to get data back and forth. You know, we've got fiber optic lines and things like that. So it's not too much of a challenge. Um, there are some um, security challenges, IT type security challenges back and forth from one location to another, but it's nothing, nothing compared to, you know, trying to go out to deep space. You heard Dr. Johnson mention earlier, early in the mission, we're a lot closer to earth, more of like a, a Leo geo kind of orbit time frame. Um we do have, we'll still be using the deep space assets to, to make those connections, but we're not just dealing with ourselves. We're dealing with those other nine payloads that, that, that Dr. Johnson was talking about that are residing on Artemis. So there's some challenges that we're going to face there early, early on in the mission, probably in the first 48 to 72 hours. Um, all those, those 10 missions are all going to be clumped in together right, right near each other. And you don't each get your own set of uh, ground antenna to communicate with. We're going to have to share assets. Um, so JPL has put together a really good plan and, and the D Deep Space Network folks of, of, of dealing with those challenges on communicating with the within the 10 payloads back and forth. Um, like I said, they all can't have their own dedicated system. So we have to share resources back and forth. Some of us have um, critical type of activities like a trajectory correction maneuver or some sort of um, power on type of ops that they would need to get done. So there's priority levels, things in that, that, that we adjust and, and get, get used to. We've been practicing now for a couple of years on, on dealing with this um, and getting everything lined up. Actually, these last few slips that we've had with Artemis is, is kind of giving us a really good hands-on experience on getting ready for this type of work on the planning side of the house. Uh, it's enabled us to, to run through our pr pr procedures, our standing operated procedures and our contingency procedures on, on how to deal with slips and launches and things like that. So it's, it's made us better. You know, a little extra time is always a blessing. And it's, I'm sure something like this, once you launch, you can't go back and test again, right? Once... Once you're out there, you're you're stuck with what you have. So um, I'd love to talk about data paths a little bit and maybe starting here on Earth, the part that we're most accustomed to. And I chuckle a little bit of the idea of even just sharing data between NASA and JPL is, is actually not trivial to most organizations, you know, inter-organization, um, cross-country um, type of data sharing is actually pretty tough. Um, you mentioned you have that pretty well solved with the fiber lines available, but there are some security challenges. Could you talk just a little bit more about on the IT side, what concerns you have? Is this all incredibly sensitive data? Um, is it data you're happy for the public to see? Um, just kind of where do you worry about security in your development process between NASA and JPL? Being a partnership with other organizations, right? So you've got Marshall, you've got JPL, you've got Caltech, um, you've got contractors that, that are out there that are part of the project. So we're always concerned with proprietary data for, for the contractors, proprietary data for, for NASA and so on and so forth. Um, so there are IT measures in place to take care of those things. Um, the HOSC has their IT. Um, the HOSC is the Huntsville Operations Support Center where we're going to do operations out of. Um, they have their procedures and policies in place. JPL has their procedures and policies in place. Sometimes those two don't always line up and match, and so there has to be adjustments and agreements put in place. So those are the, probably the, the main challenges that we face. Um, it's kind of like two houses, you know, raising their children different ways. We want to raise those kids up right, and we want to get everything done correctly, but sometimes there's compromise and sometimes there's agreements that need to be put in place of, of how we of how we deal with one another. Okay, that makes sense. I just want to jump in there for a second, if I can. Uh, Darren, you, know, you were mentioning, Molly, about the, the ground data transfer being pretty much solved, and I think that the mechanics of it may be, but JPL is not officially a NASA center. They're run by Caltech. 
And as such, uh, when, when we communicate some of our data internally, like project data, not flight data, but when we're d like designing the project, we did have a few challenges because they have different IT security policies than we have. Uh, putting things on a file share site required special permissions and identities and all these other kind of things, which are the bureaucratic overhead to assure the security. I think the physical infrastructure is in pretty good shape, but it still takes uh, a, a lot of hoops to go through uh, to get all the permissions and making sure the right people have access to that. Now, and, and yeah, and for the data we have going up to the satellite and back, that, that's a whole other challenge. I mean, Darren can probably talk to that, but I was recently reading... Uh, an article about where some folks at some hacker conference hacked an old European Space Agency satellite. And, and you know, that's not the kind of thing we want to have happening here. So NASA has all kinds of, of security protocols in place to make sure that doesn't happen. And uh, so, you know, even at all those levels, uh, sometimes it's not the physical data connections that end up being the challenge. It's it's the organizational, the uh, the, the requirements, and then worrying about what the uh, the, the bad guys are going to do. So as you think about going into lower Earth orbit, and correct me if I'm using the wrong technical terms here, this is definitely not my area of expertise. Um, as you start going to lower Earth, you say it's a little bit easier. You're closer to home. You're also closer to um, other infrastructure in space. What data will you be bringing back from lower Earth? Is it mostly about progress of the launch and getting out into space, or are you already starting to collect data, or does that data collection start once you get to the asteroid that you're targeting? So the vehicle data starts as soon as we um, deploy from from uh, SLS. As soon as we deploy out the dispenser, the, the system boots up and, and data is being produced on, on all the components inside. Um, about the only thing we wouldn't receive data on right out the gate is the camera the science data because we'll do we'll do calibrations and testing on that a little bit further on but just about everything else is 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 up and running and, and going uh, the other piece would be the solar sail itself once we deploy that that'll uh, change some of the characteristics of the attitude and control system of the propulsion system like like dr johnson was talking about um, we'll start seeing it's similar data it's just going to look a lot different with the sail the deployed than it, than it would normally and will you be trying to gather data and analyze it and make adjustments once the mission starts? Or so that's a real time process. Yeah, okay, that'll be a, that'll a, be a constant. That, what you'll be looking at. That'll be at. a constant process. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to say this is the first time we will have actually tried to use a sail to navigate and steer and to fly, and so we will have to learn the characteristics of our vehicle. Uh, as soon as it's deployed and figure out what its idiosyncrasies are, right? Uh, because if the sail has, for some reason, has a small tear, doesn't deploy all the way on one side or another, it causes it to be a little bit asymmetric, a little bit of a, of a torque. It might tilt, want to tilt a certain way. And we have to figure that out and, and work with the guidance and control people and all that to make sure we know how to, how to correct for that and, and to keep control and fly it. So there'll be a learning process of, of our ship. Uh, probably for the first several weeks as we just learn what its characteristics are. And we have that built into the different phases of our mission where we do characterizations of the solar sail. Um, we'll do uh, Doppler and, and ranging data coming off the vehicle through through the through the deep space network. Um, we'll do the actual component data that that Dr. Johnson was talking about. We'll analyze that and see and see how we're doing that way. You've got the inertial measurement unit. You've got the star trackers. You've got the sun sensors. You've got all these different components that are giving us an idea of where we're at and and how we're moving along and making sure we're on our trajectory. I I would. Probably equate it to the best ways we're flying without GPS, right? So we're doing it the old school mapping ways <laughs> of using the stars and, and, the, and the objects in space and, and trying to figure out where we're at. And then we use the radiometric data, like I said, to, to do the Doppler and the ranging. I can only imagine navigating by stars once you're actually in space, and that's a constantly changing view. That in and of itself is complex, but you must not have a lot of compute power on this toaster oven sized um I don't even know what you call it. Um, satellite? Is that what you call it? There you call it CubeSat. Yeah, it's a 6U CubeSat. CubeSat. Okay. So how do you navigate by stars when you're, you know, it's constantly changing view over millions of miles? 
it's always looking for some sort of reference point, correct? So whether the stars are using the stars themselves are using a reference point, could be the sun, could be the moon, could be the earth. All that comes into play on, on about figuring out where it's oriented and, and, and how it's facing. Um, it, not all the computing power is done on board. So it's, it's, it's more of a, a, a sampling of the data and that data will come down and then the guidance control team and the navigation team takes that into their software and their simulation software punches the numbers and comes up with, hey, this is where we're at. This is where we're going. And these are the corrections we need to make. And it's it's the reference data he talked about, plus the information we get from the Deep Space Network. That really helps us with the ranging. So we know how we orient, we're oriented. We know kind of general direction that we're going based on where all the sun, moon, and stars are. And then we're in communication and the radio signal with the Deep Space Network helps us determine exactly how far out we were, are, how fast we're moving and a little bit about the the directionality of that. So we get a lot of information from that comm system back to the Earth. So what do these networks look like? Um, Who built them? I think we're all fairly accustomed to what an Ethernet or fiber channel-based network here on Earth looks like. As you start to get further and further into space, who built these networks? What do they look like? So the Deep Space Network is consists mainly of uh, three locations. There's Goldstone in California, there's Canberra in Australia, and Madrid in Spain. And these three sites house multiple size of antennas. They have 34 meter dishes, they have 70 meter dishes. I want to say they have a couple other sizes, maybe older inventory that they still have in there. Um, these sites, these three sites are the main sites to to communicate with deep space objects. They're not generally used for for LEO and GEO type work. It's it's meant it's meant for the Mars missions. It's meant for further out deep deep space type missions. Um, as we start growing into the deep space world, these assets have more work to do, right? Because there's more objects up there and more more satellites that that they're communicating with. Um, JPL, I believe, was the the, the initiator of, of the majority of these satellites. I know they have agreements in place with the countries that they're hosted in. Um, so there's a lot of work there that's done. Um, they do also, they've been recently bringing in uh, other assets. I know the European Space Agency is, is is now bringing some of their assets into the Deep Space Network catalog or resource catalog. Um I forget all the different all the different names that are out there now. I've just been learning them because it, it's a new um, enterprise that we're learning with them. Uh, Goon Hilly, I think, is one, and there, there's a few other that are out there that that we'll be using during this mission. Um, is it uh, Morehead or yeah, it's Morehead State in Kentucky? I believe they're there. They have an antenna there that we can use for downlink only. That's part of now part of the DSN asset uh, resource assets. Uh, so yeah, so it's it's growing. They 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 recognize that there's a need to you know to have more assets on the ground. Um, they've been around, gosh, I want to say since the '80s, if not sooner. A lot of these assets, I know they've been tremendous amount of upgrades. They brief us on, on a lot of the upgrades that they have all the time. They just uh, recently went through a major upgrade here in the last couple of years um, for the. Oh gosh, I don't want to. I don't want to confuse the acronyms for the for the different uh, upgrades that they've done now, uh, but to make it stronger and more reliable is, is what the, what their goal is. Once you've arrived at the asteroid, I assume you've selected a specific asteroid already that you're targeting, or will that be selected in flight? Well, that's a challenge. Uh, everything's moving around, and depending on when we launch, there are different asteroids that have an optimal trajectory to reach them. Uh, We started out the project uh, thinking we were going to have a much earlier launch date with one asteroid target. I think it was 1991 VG was our original candidate asteroid. Um, And now we're looking at 2020 GE, uh, which basically means it was an asteroid that wasn't discovered until the year 2020. And it's still being characterized. So it, it, the one we go to, there are lots of interesting ones out there because we're, this is a, a scout mission. Uh, as its name is implied, we, we know a little bit about some of the asteroids, but everything else, uh, there, are, there are lots of them out there. and We don't know what they're made of, how large they are. Um, are they one rock, multiple small rocks stuck together? Do they have debris field on them? What are the mineralogical compositions? So there, many are interesting scientifically for Julie and her team, uh, but we're gonna, the one we visit will actually partly, in large part, depend on when we launch and, and what would be within reach of our estimated up to two to two and a half year cruise time. So right now our target's 2020 GE, but if the launch you know slips much farther, we might have a different target. Yeah, I believe we're, we're on our fourth or fifth target now since 2017. That's right. 
And I think, Les, you pretty much summarized. I was going to ask you, what do you expect or hope to learn from the data on these asteroids? I think you pretty much already answered that. But as you inspect this data, learn new things, or is there anything else you would add on you know, what kind of aspirationally you hope this might tell us? Well, I mean, aside from the, the scientific value, which is uh, justification in and of itself, uh, speaking as a physicist, <laughs> um, you know, we want to learn more about the universe and the neighborhood around us, right? I mean, if these big rocks are flying around up there, we might as well figure out what they're made from, and, and maybe it'll be useful for future space exploration. Maybe that'll be something that uh, will have resources on it that future lunar settlers or uh, people in space habitats would be able to to go and capture and bring back. There are people talking about that. Um, it's it's just uh, it's one of understanding, understanding our universe around us. And uh, we haven't really explored many of these smaller asteroids. And the asteroids that are the targets of interest uh, for Julie and her team are primarily smaller ones. And uh, we're just basically going to learn. And as you look forward into um, results starting to come back, information starting to come back and be analyzed, is this going to be something the public can watch? Is there, you know, some of these missions you see public websites set up where you can see mission updates, even some data as it comes down. Is there anything like that for folks who are watching this podcast or listening to this podcast where they could keep an eye on how this goes? Well, the NASA Public Affairs Office will be doing updates, uh, and I think that the hashtag on social media will be NEA Scout. Um, so they could do a search for, for updates on NEA Scout. We, we don't have a dedicated mission website with daily updates. It's a small mission, low-cost mission, and, and we don't have that kind of budget to do that as some of these other, other projects do. Uh, m- most of the data early on will be about where we are, the status of the solar sail, and whether we're on course. As we get closer to the asteroid, however, and we start getting the uh, what I anticipate to be really beautiful pictures back from the asteroid, I'm sure there'll be some public affairs releases of those, as well as many scientific papers to come from that. I'm sure you're right. Um, and if you look at who downloads and listens to this podcast, there's a lot of industry technology leaders um, that are designing both you know, data management, storage type technologies, but also folks who are on the networking side. One of Um, The company I work for, one of our um, lead investors built Mellanox Networks. So there's a lot of technologists who listen to this podcast. What could we do as an industry to help you? If you were to say, you know, I would love to have industry tackle one or two problems. Is there anything that would be super helpful? More ground stations, (laughs) more observation points, more uh, quicker data. That's probably, you know, think of it as your home. Back, I don't know, gosh, when I came back from England, on the internet was really just started in the late nineties. Right. And we had the dial up networks and how slow data was coming back and forth. That's kind of like we're, where we're at here a little bit. Um, I, we want to get to the gig speeds, right? That's what we want for our small satellites. Um, some of the bigger projects have that ISS has got gig speeds and things like that. But for the smaller projects, it's, it's a little bit harder because of the equipment that we use and the components that are in play. Um, so yeah, so multiple relay stations, multiple, ground assets, that those kind of things that'll help us out in deep space tremendously. You have to remember that the amount of data you get back is limited by your the capability of your, your transponder, the size of your transmitting antenna, and how much power you have available. And unfortunately, on a small spacecraft like this, we're limited in everything. <laughs> so we really have to rely on extremely capable and sensitive detectors here at home. And so we know that uh, a lot of folks are looking at how to get more power on these small spacecraft, which would help how to have, you know, uh, larger antennas that maybe are foldable antennas that can be deployed to give a larger aperture. That would help from the spacecraft technology side of it. You know, more power, more aperture always helps. But right now, getting all that in, in combination with hardware that's that can survive the radiation environment of deep space, there are just not a lot in not a lot out there and available. Yeah, and creating smaller sizes to everything, kind of like what you were saying. And what's nice is the conferences I've been attending. I'm, I'm seeing attempts out there to to do just that. I saw one the other day. I thought it was one of the the, the neatest concepts out there. Um, an organization brought in uh, a new way to develop multiple satellites, and they were all in a disk. They were all stacked on each other like a record player, and each disk was it was its own satellite deploying that way. And within the disk had solar panels that would deploy all the way around it, and it was all contained in you know probably about a two to three inch thick disk that was out there. And I was just like, that's outside the box and tremendous thinking. Let's go look at it. (laughs) 
So essentially, once you've launched and you're in orbit or wherever you want to be, it's kind of like throwing a Frisbee out, throwing your satellites out from this record stack. And then the fris- Frisbee unfolds into something a lot larger than than the, the compact right size. Yeah. Oh, it's it's there's a lot of good ideas out there. And just like anything else, it's 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 got to latch on to something. Right. I mean, we all have, there's a lot of smart people, not just within NASA in the contractor world and the in the in the educational world. Um European, you know, everywhere, all around global. I mean, there's there's so much knowledge and so much information out there. Um, it's it's about getting your foot foot in the door and and start developing that that work, and and so others can use it. Well, we're also working to improve that using some of the technology that NEA Scout is going to demonstrate. There's another project that's a little bit smaller scale than even NEA Scout that will fly in a low Earth orbit next year, and it's called Lisa T. And Lisa T is the lightweight integrated solar array and antenna. And its genesis was just just real quickly, the, the solar sail that we're deploying, the big sheet of aluminum that looks like a sail on a sailing ship, is thinner than a human hair. And we're deploying 925 square feet of sail. Yeah, so we have we have four booms that will deploy out, and each of those booms are over 20 feet long. Okay. And the sail is is folded and wrapped on a spool. So as the as the booms go out, it's going to pull the sail out. And there there are animations on the internet. Um, if you go to YouTube and, and Google NEA Scout or look for NEA Scout, uh, you'll find some videos that show the animation. We have uh, videos out there of our ground deployment tests where people can see what this sail looks like. Um, you can also learn more about the mission by uh, looking for NASA and NEA Scout on the internet. But where I was going with the Lisa T is when we were developing the, the spacecraft and the sail, uh, we were looking also at, at the, the rapid advancement of thin film photovoltaics here on the ground that are, that are used for generating electrical power. Now, they're not real high efficiency. They're not designed to survive long in deep space. But for small spacecraft like NEA Scout and other CubeSats that are power starved, if you could, could deploy a sail of some size, I mean, NEA Scout's almost 1,000 square feet, and cover it with photovoltaics, you could generate a lot of power. And that power could go into your transponder, it could go into other things to increase your, 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 your link margins and everything else. And the antenna part of Lisa T is we have embedded in this unfurled sail little antenna elements. Uh, which give you a larger scale antenna. Now, right now, that's geared for low Earth orbit spacecraft. It's not going to work for for deep space at expand or anything like that, but it's a first step. So the NEA Scout is demonstrating the solar sail propulsion aspect of these deployables, but the lightweight integrated solar array and antenna experiment, which will fly next year, uh, will demonstrate using that deployable structure for power, and for improving some of your calm. So so the, we're also looking at that for space applications, but it's got a long way to go before we could have used it on, on NEA Scout at the distances we're going to be flying. How do you test this? Do you have simulation environments here on Earth where you're testing these solar sails, or is it... Is it a physical actual test or are you simulating with computers both? For packaging and deployment, we we do tests on the ground. I mean, we can deploy the sail on the ground. Gravity really is a challenge because it's much stronger force than the, the solar pressure. So we can only really test packaging and deployment on the ground. The actual flight of the sail is all in models. Uh, we know what light pressure is. We know how, how bright the sun is, and we know how light reflects and, and how all that is. So we, we really won't uh, measure anything to do with the photon pressure on the sail until we're in space. Um, those kind of measurements have been done on the ground, but not on our sail. You just can't do it. Now, if somebody will invent an anti-gravity chamber, <laughs> we could do that. But unfortunately, according to what we know about physics, that's not even possible. So Really? I, I would have thought that that would be a solvable problem. I, totally off topic, but why do physicists um, feel it's not possible to do an anti-gravity chamber? <laughs> well, that's a whole other podcast in and of itself. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we can not simulate to data um, unchained, but super well, interesting. I mean, well, there are ways that you can you can simulate the weightless environment of space. I mean, it's uh, going into an, air, an airplane and, and going into a free fall environment. Uh, makes physical objects behave as if there is no gravity acting on them, even though it is. It's just your environment's falling at the same rate uh, as, as, as everything else. But you really can't shield mass. Gravity is called by, caused by uh, an object's mass. 
and we have no way of, of creating negative mass, which would be a repulsive force, uh, nor do we have a way of shielding the effect of gravity. Uh, there's just no known way to do that. And, it, and until, uh, until somebody comes up with some physics that says, hey, yes, you can go do this, we're stuck with it. And we have to go where uh, the, the effects of gravity are minimized and, and we're out there to test these systems. Darren, I'm curious, what are the data rates that you're working with as you go through the different orbits and depths of space? Because of the distance that, that we'll be at, you know, around the 1 AU max distance, um, the type of transponder that we're using, um, the, the iris radio, and the, and the capabilities of that radio, uh, we're looking at uh, 8 kilobytes per second down rate and then 1 kilobyte per second up rate um, throughout the mission. Depending on where we're at in our orbit, those rates will fluctuate. Um, we have overhead for uh, CCSDS, which is, oh gosh, I forget the acronym now, but the CCSDS standard rates, we, we take off about 17% of the data rate for overhead, um, just to drop signal, um, getting through different systems, things like that. Um, so it's a little less than 8, 8K down and 1K up, that sort of deal. So not streaming Netflix while you're up there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I would think that the efficiencies that the developers who are looking at the overhead and how they can get 17% to 16% and not 20%, probably every percent matters a lot. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Been, and, that, really and, and, and you know, it's funny you say that is because that we do have to take that into account for the number of contacts we need to downlink uh, an image of, of the asteroids. Um, we wouldn't be able to do that necessarily in... in in multiple images in one pass. One, because our, our transponder with our thermal and power limits can't handle it. We can't be on that long. Um, and then the amount of data coming down off an image. So, you know, we have to go in and calculate that and break it up into smaller pieces, what we call concatenating. And then we, we measure, hey, I can take this piece down in this contact, another piece down in another contact, and maybe finally the final piece in a third contact. Something along those lines to, to make it simpler. Well, thank you both for joining Data Unchained. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Um, we'll definitely be, I personally, and I'm sure our guests will be keeping an eye on when you do launch and get the um, entire mission started. But in the interim, wishing you the very best of luck. And thank you so much for your time and your insights today. Thank you. We appreciate your interest. Thanks for listening to Data Unchained, powered by Hammerspace. To learn more, visit hammerspace.com. If you have a guest you would like to hear on the show, email me at molly at hammerspace.com.